All right, morning everyone. Uh, uh, we'll start off with an apology. Death by PowerPoint. I'm sorry, there's a lot of words in this proposal or in this presentation. It's basically the Washington State wanted to try and deal with. Uh, I see a few people have spotted a little critter up in that particular slide. Uh, a little green shell muscle up in there, green muscle. Um, Washington State wanted to develop a biofiling management plan because effectively everything has been ad hoc up to this point. Well, actually, management has been ad hoc, so if something nasty comes in, they deal to it right away. So they're trying to be a little bit more strategic in their thinking. So basically what I'm providing here, so I'll pop over here. What I'm providing here is a summary of the presentation that we provided back in January, which tried to deal with or tried to present this proposal or this um, management plan that we put together. So I'll just move through them fairly quickly. There are a lot of slides, there's a lot of text. I'm gonna move through it fast because a lot of what I've said, what I'm gonna be saying, you've already heard this morning. So if anybody wants to stop, please just stop me midstream and if you want me to talk about things a little bit more. So effectively, the management imperative, well, we all know what the management imperative is, don't we? Effectively, we need to have a strategic framework for dealing with biofiling issues. Again, I'm gonna move through things fairly quickly. So what this particular paper is presenting is an overarching strategy, and that strategy provides guiding principles for managing impacts of biofiling species, and it's also gonna provide an operational plan. So not just the background strategy, what are we trying to do for an overarching basis, but you know, how are we going to achieve these things? Okay, we all know the two pillars of biosecurity in the aquatic environment, ballast water and biofiling, that's what we're here to talk about. Um, we've got information from the uh, National Ballast Water Information Clearinghouse, the database from the US, which talks about the number of different vessel arrivals. So we've got roughly 4,200 different annual vessel arrivals in Washington state waters. Um, roughly a third of those discharge ballast water, so you get about 15 million tons of ballast water per year. Now I'm only talking about ballast water just to sort of set the scene a little bit. Again, ballast water, we understand what the pathway is. We've seen this little figure before. Um, risk is very heavily weighted by the last site that ballast water was abstracted. That's going to be one of your main drivers of biofouling or uh, invasive species risk. So biofouling is slightly different. We know we've got a very complex pathway. The risk is integrated. So you're actually dealing with everything from the last time that you completely cleaned up and had new anti-fouling put on. So we're looking at seeing multiple ports, multiple bioregions, all affecting that risk profile for a vessel. And we know that there's a wide variety of factors that do increase that risk, the traffic, where is the originating port, climate variability, maintenance practices and procedures, the types of vessels. Again, moving through things fairly quickly. Again, also looking at the, uh, the ballast water clearinghouse data, we see roughly that eight year period, 2008 to 2016, over 30,000 vessel arrivals. Seattle and Tacoma are by far the busiest ports that we're, that we're aware of. Then you've got Vancouver, Longview, and Kalama, freshwater ports, so they're not gonna be having the same sort of issues with marine species. And I'll stop at this point and say that we're really focusing on biofiling, we're not focusing on freshwater biofiling, so we're not dealing with a zebra mussel or quagga mussel in this particular program. That's being dealt with in other programs. We also look again from the uh, ballast, water ballast water information, uh, ports of origin, that's very difficult for you to see. It's actually even difficult for me to see, to tell the truth. Um, most of the vessels are coming from the US and Canada. Uh, Canada primarily from Vancouver and Vancouver, Victoria. Japan, uh, other areas of Southeast Asia, China, those where most of the vessels are coming from. The rest are primarily interstate or in, from other parts of the US. And you can see that on the right hand side. California is a big contributor, Alaska, Washington, Oregon, and Hawaii. And again, more information on ports of, or, ports of origin. Uh, sorry, it's not actually all that clear for you to see. Um, basically, to look at is the port of origin a marine or a freshwater port, and is there any, are there any invasive species actually present? So that's all contributes towards the risk profile of vessels. And again, just like Jules was talking about before and some of the others, 
it's vessel specific risk. We look at the maintenance practices, we look at the speed of the vessels, we look at stationary periods, whether or not the vessels are actually hanging around in port for a long period of time. We do know that even a, a basically a new build, if it hangs around in port for 50, 100, 200 days, the vessel risk rises quite dramatically. And if we look at those different types of vessels, the vessel risk categories, um, we see that different types of vessels, different categories of vessels have different risks that have been traditionally associated. So things like container ships, bulkers, tankers, they've been given a low risk rating in the past. Um, some papers suggest that they actually should be much higher given the much higher volume of uh, traffic that we're dealing with. But on an individual ship basis, we've kind of looked at it and said, okay, a container ship is relatively low risk. Now there's some other information which has come out or is coming out and I'll be talking about tomorrow which suggests that might not necessarily be the case. So we're probably going to have to revisit these particular categories in the future. And again, I won't go into this too, in too much detail because we've already been talking about other federal and, and global biofouling guidance and regulation. Obviously the IMO, we've got the, the vessel general permit from the US EPA, the, the US Coast Guard, basically looks after or looks after monitoring vessel jet, the vessel general permits. Not going to speak about that at all. Um, other regional international approaches, Alaska, there's not really anything going on there. There's a bit of information, have, or a bit of biofouling management in British Columbia. Oregon, they're looking at developing a new system and we've already heard about California and Hawaii this morning. And of course we all know about what's going on in Australia and New Zealand, there is a lot of biofouling awareness and the management is, should I say in a state of flux? Yeah, it's in a state of flux. But it is quite, it's quite a strong system down here and we really are in this part of the world seen as leaders for the rest of the world. Okay, part of the program involved, again, providing that overarching strategy, what are the guiding principles for the strategy? How is it we're actually pulling all of this together? So there are seven key principles, and I'm sure most of you will all be aware of, of most of these already. Uh, the idea is around, we're really trying to protect the environment, the economy, and our communities. We're looking at this from a shared perspective, so we want to get everybody on board. We'll take a preventative risk-based approach. We're looking at integrated management, and we're going to be underpinning that with a, a series of performance measures, so we can make sure we are doing what we're supposed to be doing, and uh, really trying to get ahead of the curve by getting into some applied research and development of reactive biofouling management tools and other things. I'll move through these also relatively quickly. Um, with each of the main principles, so environmental, economic, and community protection, in this case, there are a series of outcomes, and each outcome has some activities associated with that. Now, I've trimmed these down quite a bit in terms of what the different uh, activities are, but we're looking at we want healthy and resilient ecosystems. And we all know that if you have a resilient ecosystem, it's much better at responding to an invasive species threat. We, want, um, we don't want to have impacts on economic activities. We don't want to have impacts on our recreational, our aesthetic, or cultural values. We don't want to have impacts on human health and well-being. So all these things need to be taken into account when we're pulling together the strategy for what we're trying to do. Shared responsibility is obviously a big one, so it's important that all the partners of the biosecurity system are actually engaged, and we're all pulling together roughly in the same way. At least that, that is the main hope. And a lot of you would have seen this particular graphic before from the Victoria EPA, so we take that preventative approach. We're trying to get ahead of the curve, spend a lot less money on prevention than we will actually have to do if you're trying to get up into asset-based protection and reaction. Next principle again, I'm, I know I'm preaching to the converted, it's all about risk-based management. So we want to look at things, we want to look at vector risks, organism risks, and try and determine just how we can actually get ahead of the curve in terms of managing these species and managing these particular impacts on the environment. Integrated regulation is key. We need to pull everybody together, we need to be working with not just Washington State by itself, we need to be working with California with Hawaii, with New Zealand and Australia. We need to be pulling together as a group so we've got really one set of regulations industry can go to and say, okay, I understand, as Jules mentioned earlier, 
I understand that everybody's trying to do the same sorts of thing. You just keep hammering home that same message and it will eventually sink in. There's a wide variety of performance, managers, uh, performance measures associated. I'm not going to go through them because there are 10 different ones. <laughs> And then there's the key of underpinning everything is a program of applied research. So developing these reactive tools, developing abilities to respond to marine pest incursions when they actually do occur. Okay, so that's the overarching view. You can see where we're, we're actually coming from. We're trying to develop that, I guess, that strategic viewpoint. Now we're getting down into the nitty gritty of the program structure itself. So this is what we want. We're looking for an integrated risk-based management approach that's going to be informed by rigorous science. So we're trying to pull together something that will hopefully be future-proofed so that when things do happen, we can respond in an appropriate and hopefully robust manner. Again, risk-based management, it's got to be flexible, it's got to be precautionary, and it's also got to be proportionate. So you don't want to be spending a massive amount of money on something that's going to have a relatively low impact on the environment, economy, society. So we have to take all these things into account when we're developing the system itself. More information, we need to characterize the vectors themselves, what are the nature of those particular vector threats. We have to understand risk assessment guidelines or risk assessment approaches. We need to be able to mitigate in, term, in case everything does actually get in. And backing that up, of course, is the legislative and regulatory framework. You need to have those particular tools in place for everything to fall together. So if we talk about sort of the core components of how this actually works, obviously we want to have a framework that emphasizes cooperative management. So we're dealing with different, um, different regulators across different jurisdictions and also across the uh, wide variety of different, I guess, <coughs> stakeholder groups that are involved. We need a good administrative functions. There has to be a good communications and engagement program because public awareness, as we've said before, is really key. And there has to be good self-management programs as well. We want to be moving people towards or organizations towards self-management so that organizations are responding really appropriately and with a good community conscience. Now within the administrative framework, obviously you need people. Uh, the uh, particular program within Washington, De Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife only has a few people in it currently, so those recommendations actually expand it by quite a large, uh, quite four or five people at least. Uh, Obviously, we need supplies, equipment, you need training, there's cost for travel, um, capital investments need to be taken into place, contracting as well. So all these things which are, I'll be honest, really boring to have to deal with sometimes, all needs to be part of the strategy and the, uh, the five-year plan. Again, communications and engagement is very important. You need to get people on board, and that's not just people that own vessels. But you need to get the community on board as well through having focused workshops uh, to really engaging with your stakeholders overall. And those stakeholders are not just the community, they're the other organizations, the shipping companies, they're the other regulatory agencies, the oil and gas companies, all very important to get these people on board. Again, more of the different programs that are actually out there right now. Um, Washington does have quite a number of good programs for managing aquatic pests overall, but again, it's been very reactive or it's been very ad hoc so again this is trying to pull everything together into a sort of holistic or at least considered approach. I mentioned before we're trying to move towards self-management. We want to get organizations to be managing their own uh, biofouling risks effectively. So we need to uh, really we need to provide a self-management toolbox so that people know, so that organizations know what they have to do, how they can assess the risk, how they can actually manage the risk. And there are a wide variety of different compliance categories. We'll just skip over that. Here's one of the key things. What does this apply to? So are we talking about every potential vector that comes into Washington State? Eventually, that would be the case. We would like to see that. But initially, the ship or the program is only going to be applied to commercial vessels, but effectively vessels greater than 300 gross registered tons. That's the focus at this point, and that's consistent with what's been going on in California and other jurisdictions. 
So there will be times that a vessel over 300 GRT is actually exempt. So the first one would be in the event of emergency. Obviously, safety of life at sea is of paramount importance, so if there's an emergency, vessel can come in. If the vessel has actually just come out of dry dock or relatively recently, so depending on its maintenance history and its voyage history, it may be exempt from the particular application of the strategy itself. If a vessel has been inspected within the last 45 days, it may be exempt. So there's a number of, number of different exemptions. And also U.S. Navy, Coast Guard, and state naval militia vessels are also exempt from uh, ap application of the program. If a vessel wants to remain in state waters for more than two days, the vessel operator is going to have to compile appropriate information to self-assess, to self-assess the risk. And we're using a tool that we've developed based on, and if anybody's worked in Western Australia in the past decade knows, based on the risk assessment spreadsheets that we've used in WA. If the assessed risk is uncertain or high, then the department may provide extra guidance on what's required for the vessel to either come into the state, remain in the state, or maybe perhaps be barred from state waters. And sorry, it's a little bit, it's actually quite a bit of focus, but effectively this is the, this is a flow chart that vessel operators can use to assess, you know, are they actually going to be compliant with the strategy? Can they come into state waters themselves? And I don't know why that's quite so fuzzy. I guess it's uh, trying to get too much into a small slide. Happy to show you a hard copy if anybody's particularly interested in it. All right, there's a wide variety of programs that are supporting this particular risk-based management approach. Obviously, we need to have really good, strong, sound evidence. So we need to have good information on risk assessment of the vessels. There needs to be really good biofiling record keeping, surveillance, inspection, monitoring. We need to understand the nature of the organisms, the threats, their impacts, and we need to do risk assessment on those organisms as well. So the better the supporting information we have, the better response we can actually, uh, actually do. And here's this vessel risk self-assessment program. Looks into the same sort of things as Jules was talking about earlier, so vector type, operational profiles, anti-fouling paints, that sort of thing. Um, you can't see anything, can you? <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, it's brilliant. <laughs> Each of the individual factors, they've been tested in a number of, a number of uh, jurisdictions around the world, but each of the individual factors needs to be refined. There needs to be, some of you people in the audience need to be looking at these with the, with the state and saying, right, well, I disagree with that particular factor. I want that to be higher. I want that risk to be lower. So we need that sort of input. And as the state moves forward with implementing this program, there's going to be a call out to the wider community like this to get some of this information to test some of these uh, assumptions that we're making. Again, we're not very far from finished. Again, we know about biofiling management records, how important they are to maintain those. Um, just because we maintain records or we have a biofiling management plan doesn't necessarily mean that we're actually managing biofiling effectively, I will say that. Um, one of the programs that, this program that Sonia mentioned this morning about the uh, looking at commercial vessels in Australia, we've seen that Two-thirds of the vessels that we've surveyed actually have biofouling management plans, but those two-thirds are not necessarily the cleanest ships that we've seen. So just because you've got a BMP doesn't mean you're actually doing a good job with it. More programs supporting risk-based management. Surveillance, we've got targeted surveillance, pathway surveillance, and also passive surveillance as well. Understanding the biology of organisms is key, so we need to understand what we're actually dealing with. It's no good trying to manage just the sporophyte of Andaria, for instance, if you're not managing the gametophyte as well, which is microscopic, you can't see it. It's very difficult to actually uh, disinfect a surface that has those gametophytes on there, which are quite tough. If you don't understand the biology, you can't manage effectively. So that's got to be all rolled into the package as well. And finally, we're talking about future proofing. How do we actually get ahead of the curve? What are the programs that we need to really get in and do some applied biofouling research. What are those are different early detection tools that we can have? So next generation DNA fingerprinting. We need rapid response capabilities. We need long-term control tools as well. So we need to put all of this information together. We need obviously a pretty good budget to do this. We need some expertise. We need the people in this room to be engaging 
particularly with the state, and the state will be in engaging with you, to develop these tools, to develop this system and really implement it. And I want to at this point acknowledge the quite a large number of people that have been involved. Um, the program has only actually been running, not the program has been running, but the development of this program has actually taken only just over a year. And that's in marked contrast to what was going on in California where they, how many iterations of their program have they tried before they've got it up and running. So this is actually building on the successes and the difficulties that have been experienced in the jurisdictions. So Alan Ploysa and Amanda Newsom from the Department of Fish and Wildlife in uh, Washington are really the drivers behind this particular program. And you can see that the people that have been involved uh, particularly want to acknowledge MPI for their work in uh, reviewing the earlier draft of the proposal or of the strategy itself because they really put a lot of effort into that. It was much appreciated. And with that, any questions? John. Yeah. 